Okay, three practices. Can you all hear me? Just, yeah? A little louder, okay. Um, three practices. Imagine you're all leaders, and imagine you want to be transpartisan leaders. To me, one of the questions is, what are the obstacles? What are the obstacles to being a transpartisan leader, to becoming a transpartisan leader, to carrying on transpartisan work? And I can immediately think of some things. I can think of when you do this work, what do you come up against? A lot of fear. People have a lot of fear of you know, losing their identity. They have, there's a lot of distrust. You deal with a lot of anger in politics. Uh, so you have a lot of what might be called negative emotions that you have to deal with when you're doing this transpartisan work. There's rigid positions where people are locked into their positions. This is the progressive position. This is the conservative position. You deal with that a lot. And there are, behind those positions, there are a lot of unmet needs, dissatisfied needs. There's a lot of dissatisfaction. So the question is, what are some practices that can break through those obstacles, that can deal with those obstacles? First obstacle I'd like to say is actually none of those. The first and most important obstacle to being a transpartisan leader is right here, it's ourselves. The biggest barrier to our being successful as a leader, and particularly as a transpartisan leader, is our tendency, which is very human, very natural, to react. In other words, to act without thinking, to act immediately out of fear, to act immediately out of anger. As Ambrose Bierce once said, when angry, you will make the best speech you will ever regret. <laughs> and that happens a lot in politics, is we act, even though politics is supposed to be goal-oriented behavior, we're trying to achieve certain things, in the end, we get in our own way through our reactions. And you see that all the time in politics. It's reaction, reaction. Why did you do that? Because they did that. That's the, that's the explanation. Not because I'm trying to get to a certain goal. So we get in our own way. So the very first practice I'd like to suggest is a practice of imagining that you are dealing with the other side, you're on a stage. Uh, you know, that you're interacting with the other side on a stage. It's a drama. Politics is a drama. Imagine that your mind goes to a mental, emotional balcony overlooking that stage where you can get some perspective, you can get some clarity, you can, you can see what's going on, you can remember what's important to you. So going to the balcony to me is the foundation of being a successful leader. Now, how do you go to the balcony? In today's world, internet, texting, email, everything's going off simultaneously, uh, cell phones. Uh, the most important thing is to, is to be able to slow down for a moment. Uh, I have a friend who's an emergency room surgeon. Everything has gone going crazy in the surgery room. His motto is always, slow down, we're in a hurry. The nature of transpartisan work is everyone's in a hurry. We've got to get this agenda done. We've got to get this done. The motto has to be if you want to go fast, you have to go slow because human minds don't change overnight. Human hearts don't change overnight. So going to the balcony, learning to suspend our natural reaction. I mean, just to go back in American history for a moment to the Constitution. The Constitution was being negotiated uh, in a very hot, steamy, summer in Philadelphia two centuries ago without air conditioning. So you can imagine the tempers rising, small states, large states, all this anger and fear. And Thomas Jefferson used to like to remind people, he said, when, a when angry, count to 10. If very angry, 100. Simply because even then, they knew that physiologically, if you just pause for a moment, if you just give your, just take one deep breath or two deep breaths, or just pause for a moment, before you react to what the other side is saying, maybe that gives you a moment to go to the balcony, think about, okay, what's really gonna advance us here? What's gonna advance the interests of the small states? Protect the interests of the population as a whole. Whatever, whatever the situation was. So going to the balcony to me is that, is that fundamental first step, first practice I would suggest. Second practice is let's imagine you've gone to the balcony. You're on the balcony, but the other side isn't. They're angry, they're fearful, they're, they're, they're distrusting. How do you begin to deal with that? Here, to me, the most important practice, which is something we hear often, but we often don't practice so often, is the art of listening. Uh, 
you know, it's interesting to me that listening is maybe the most fundamental, maybe the most fundamental skill or competence that we need to be a good leader uh, in life, and yet we never teach it. I mean, do you, do you ever take a course on listening? I mean, you've, you've been taught, you went through all these years of education, but did you ever get a class on listening? It's just kind of assumed. But listening well is not easy. The way people listen in politics is first they don't listen. And as you notice, uh, you know, uh, whether it's C-SPAN or whatever, you know, if you actually looked at, people are talking, but there's no, there's no, there's no one in the seats. There's no one listening. And if anyone's in the seat, they're, they're texting or they're doing something else. There's very little listening going on. Then if there is listening, as maybe in a debate or something, what they're listening is the kind of listening is listening to, in order to immediately refute or contradict what the other side is saying. That's a kind of listening, but it's not the kind of listening I'm talking about. I'm talking about a listening, which is the kind of listening that we need if we're really aiming to influence people, to change hearts and minds. I mean, how can we change hearts and minds if we don't know where those hearts and minds are? So true listening is about the act of empathy. It's the act, empathy is different than sympathy. Sympathy is feeling with, empathy is is feeling into, M means into. In other words, it's listening from within the frame of reference of the other side. We, all, we always listen from within our frame of reference, and so there's part of our critic, a little inner critic, inner judge saying, that's wrong, that's right, I disagree with that, I agree with that, I disagree with that. What I'm talking about is a kind of listening where you actually put yourself in the shoes of the other, imagine you're in their shoes for a moment, imagine you're feeling what they're feeling, and trying to listen from within their frame of reference. That is good for two reasons. One, if you're trying to influence them, let's imagine you know, they're, they're an enemy. You know, the first rule in warfare is know your enemy. How are you going to know that? So even there you want to do that. But there's a much more important reason, which goes back to the word respect. The most the simplest way that we can show respect doesn't mean to agree with the other side, but to show respect to them is to listen to them to give them a chance to listen. That's why, for example, in the University of Paris, back in the Middle Ages, when they were having these big theological debates, they adopted a very simple practice that I think works well, too, in transpartisan dialogue, which is when someone made a point, their opponent or the other side could not make their point until they could repeat or paraphrase the first person's point to the satisfaction of that first person. So someone would make a point, then party B would have to re, you know, really capture that point to the satisfaction of party A, and only then could the conversation proceed. It slows down the conversation, but it actually makes it much more efficient and effective because you're not having this kind of uh, no listening, an exercise in mutual non-listening. So listening turns out to be key. Uh, and the third practice, I would say, is once you've listened, is the art of what I call, what, what might be called, uh, is reframing. Uh, because you're up, against, you're up against the obstacle of rigid positions. And that's what you see in politics all the time, is people are digging into their positions. It's almost like they're in a giant kind of World War I kind of fight where everyone's digging in, trenches, fortifications, I'm not moving, I'm not budging, a lot of stonewalling going on. How do you deal with rigid positions? Our natural tendency when the other side takes a rigid position is we reject it. But when you reject their position, what do they usually do? They dig in further, right? So you just, you know, you're just playing their game. You're just playing the game of positions. The question is, how do you change the game? In other words, it's almost like there's a spotlight in any interaction there. The spotlight can either be on positions, and where you'd like to be, the spotlight to be to change that, move that spotlight is over here on what are people's needs and interests and concerns? What are they worried about? Why are they taking that position? And what are some creative possibilities that might address their needs as well as address yours? So how do you move that spotlight? In other words, the greatest power that we have is the power to change the game, to move that spotlight. How do you change the game? You change the frame. You reframe. And one of the most powerful ways of reframing is to ask good questions. Usually in politics, the questions are very much either or kind of questions, closed questions. Are you in favor of this or not? You know, the kind of polling kind of questions or, you know, you, you, get, you get a choice. It's just binary. But the best kinds of questions, as you know, as 
students and educators and so on, the best kind of questions are, tend to be open-ended questions. Like, how do you, how would you solve this problem of education? How would you deal with energy efficiency? It's not, are you in favor of this or not? But those questions lead to a conversation. So if someone takes a rigid position, for example, one question to ask is, help me understand what's behind that. We had a, a transpartisan dialogue some years ago where we had uh, Al Gore on one side and head of the Sierra Club, and then we had a lot of people who don't believe in what Al Gore is saying about climate change and so on on the other side. And what was interesting to me was both sides thought, you know, they just heard the other side's position, but they didn't understand what, what was really behind it. And the thing that, that impressed me in listening to those conversations, when we dug under those positions, for example, the people who were skeptical and outright critical uh, of what Al Gore was saying about climate change and so on, one of their deep concerns was that they saw climate change, they saw all the environmental concern about environment as simply a smoke screen for bringing back big government which would deprive them of fundamental liberties. They didn't understand, that, that, that's how they saw it. And so, but once you can listen and you move that spotlight from positions, which is, you know, I think we ought to do this, we ought to have a carbon tax, I'm against that, to what's the real underlying concern, then you can start to deal with those underlying fears about big government. Are there ways, for example, of dealing with energy and climate that don't necessarily arouse fears that there's gonna be some kind of big government takeover? Can we do that? But only when you can reframe, move the spotlight from positions interest. And so that led into a conversation about, for example, energy efficiency, which is energy efficiency of something that, yeah, we can all agree upon. And so the question was, how could we move together and work together on energy efficiency? So that's the whole idea is you keep on moving that spotlight from positions to interests. How? By reframing, by asking good questions. So those are the three tools I would suggest uh, as possible ways of overcoming these obstacles. You overcome the obstacle of your own natural reaction by going to the balcony. You overcome the obstacle of fear and distrust by listening to the other side, truly listening from within their frame of reference. And you overcome the obstacle of rigid positions by reframing, asking good problem-solving questions. Let me just end, if I may, with one story from American history again of uh, a time when the United States, when we were fighting each other violently. The Civil War, which was an incredible uh, tragedy, really, for, the, for this country. And, uh, with, uh, and our president, Abraham Lincoln, at the time, as you recall, he was, as a leader, and as I would say, a real, a transpartisan leader, he had that spirit. He was trying to lead for the whole. And he was feeling, in his heart, grief and uh, and also concern for how are we going to bind the wounds of the nation after such a terrible bloodletting, bloodletting between brothers, between, within families. And so uh, at one point, he made a speech in the White House in which he was talking sympathetically about the plight of the South. And there was a Yankee patriot in the audience who could not tolerate this kind of talk. And so she said to him, Mr. President, how dare you talk kindly of our enemies when you ought to be thinking of destroying them? And Lincoln thought about it for a moment, went to the balcony, listened, tried to reframe, and he said, Madam, do I not destroy my enemy when I turn them into my friend? And I think that's the real task, underlying task, of, uh, of transpartisan leadership, which is how do we destroy our enemies by turning them into our friends? It doesn't mean that we agree with them. We may often disagree with them on many things, but we can still treat them with basic human respect, basic human connection, recognizing that we're all part of the same whole. Thank you very much.